Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Len Calabrese and I am uh, very excited to uh, present this in interactive webinar on COVID-19. Uh, you know, we were just talking that, uh, uh, as I always like to say, it's a, a river that you can't step into the same one twice because uh, we're not the same people and it's not the same river. And boy, today the news is just kind of flying around this. So, um, joining me today um, uh, are two good friends and colleagues, uh, Xavier Mariette, Professor of Rheumatology at Herod Sud University, and Kevin Winthrop, uh, Professor of Infectious Diseases at Oregon Health Science University. Welcome, guys. Hi, Hi guys. How are you? Great. All right. So the, the bell is on. Uh, <laughs> I was bad. I didn't do that. Uh, all right, so uh, these are our disclosures. And we're going to uh, have a few housekeeping things here. We hope to keep this really interactive and a lot of uh, back and forth. So um, uh, we'll, uh, as you can see, attendees will be on mute. Uh, put the questions in the uh, question and answer uh, uh, box. Um, uh, and if you have any uh, issues, just uh, throw down on them in the same uh, in the same box. So this is what it's going to look like. Um, I don't know how these guys are going to do this uh, because there's so much data. Uh, uh, Xavier is going to talk about uh, the, the uh, wild west of immune-based therapies uh, in COVID-19. Um, we'll talk. Uh, some questions and answers, and Kevin's going to tell us everything we need to know about vaccines and autoimmunity uh, in 15 minutes, and then we'll solve that problem, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll engage. So are we ready to go here? Good. And we're going to turn this over to Xavier. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Len, for this uh, introduction. I'm very pleased to share with you the status of clinical trials of uh, immune-based therapies in COVID-19. And my objective is to convince you that we, as rheumatologists, we have a big role to play in the fight against this disease because we are, uh, of course, very aware of uh, immune mechanism and of immunomodulators drug. So, uh, you, you do know that uh, uh, in COVID-19, we first have a stage of uh, a viral infection, viral infestation with an antiviral response. And this antiviral response uh, plays uh, is an inflammatory response, which is most of the cases is going to cure the disease. But in some cases, there is an increase of the inflammatory response, which is called an hyperinflammatory status. And this hyperinflammatory status is going to lead to a worsening of the patients and to the worsening of the respiratory status of the patients. And of course, to fight against this hyperinflammatory status, uh, immunomodulators are the drugs of choice. And it is a drug that we use every day uh, in our clinics in patients with uh, rheumatic autoimmune diseases. And just to convince you that hyperinflammation, I prefer using the term hyperinflammation that a cytokine storm, because it's not really a storm, it is an hyperinflammation status. And you can see that the level of some uh, inflammatory cytokines is predictive of outcome in uh, COVID-19. You can see this big study of 1,500 patients uh, hospitalized in New York. You can see that the baseline level of I6 and TNF was predictive of death in these patients. I8 is elevated, I1 beta is elevated, but it's not predictive of a worse outcome in these patients. 
So we are going to firstly to uh, speak about the most uh, uh, very well known uh, immunomodulators, which is corticosteroids. And you do know very well this study from UK, the recovery study, 6,000 patients showing that in patients with COVID-19, hospitalized with COVID-19, there is a benefit of dexamethasone with a decrease of mortality of 17%, as you can see on the slide. But just re remark that mortality is still very high, even in the patients with dexamethasone. What is very important is to look at the subgroup. If you look at the patients without any oxygen requirement, you can see there is no benefit of dexamethasone. Conversely, dexamethasone uh, leads to a worse outcome. It is deleterious, as you can see here. But dexamethasone is beneficial in patients receiving oxygen or in patients in ICU receiving invasive medical ventilation. And from this study, dexamethasone has become the standard of care in these patients on oxygen or in ICU. There was a meta-analysis of the uh, use of dexamethasone in ICU patients in the JAMA, confirming this 30% decrease of mortality in these very critical patients in ICU when they were receiving dexamethasone, the dose is six milligrams per day during seven to 14 days. What about now other immunomodulators? And I will play some a little time with I6 inhibitors. We already have eight randomized trials with tocilizumab in COVID. Four of them met their primary endpoint. As you can see, either ventilation or death or survival, but four of them did not meet their primary endpoint. And we can uh, asking ourselves why. Probably in these negative trials, you can see the mortality rate is very low, between two to 5%. It means that some of the patients were included without any requ oxygen requirement. So it may explain some of the difference. In this Brazilian study, uh, there was really a, a deleterious effect of TOSI, but it is the only one today. So probably we do think now there is probably a window of opportunity for TOSI. Patients on oxygen when they are worsening on dexamethasone. And there is today a WHO meta-analysis which is ongoing. And we are conducting in France now a new study which is standard of care dexamethasone versus dexamethasone plus tocilizumab. And I hope we will have this results very soon. We have almost 400 patients included in this study. Just to show you the result of the, our first study in France from the Corimuno group, which uh, included patients with oxygen, three liters per minute, and we randomized usual care, but at that time, usual care was not corticosteroid. Some of the patients had, but the majority of the patients did not have steroids versus usual care plus tocilizumab, two doses, as you can see on the slide. 130 patients, and here's a primary endpoint, which was ventilation or death. As you can see that, uh, the primary endpoint was met, and there is a benefit of tocilizumab regarding this primary endpoint. If you consider only mechanical ventilation or death, it is the same uh, benefit of tocilizumab. But if you look at survival at D28, there was absolutely no difference. But just remark that the survival is much better than in the recovery study in these patients, of course, not in ICU, but patients on oxygen. But we have new data now up to day 90. It's not yet published, but it is in press. And you can see if you consider now survival until day 90, there is a tendency to a better survival in the patients with TOSI. And interestingly, we now have the data depending on the level of CRP at baseline. And these data are not published yet. And I share this data with you. You can see on the right, that in the patients with high CRP, there is a benefit of tocilizumab. As you can see here, the patients with high CRP, uh, 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 you can see here toci versus usual care. Conversely, in the patients with low CRP, there was no benefit of uh, tocilizumab. So it can be an indication of the type of patients who should be treated with tocilizumab in the future. Uh, a second very important point with tocilizumab in COVID-19 patients is the safety, because of course we, are, we were very worried about an increased risk of infection in these patients. And what we saw in our study is that the risk of serious infection, serious secondary infection, was actually decreased with tocilizumab compared with standard of care. 
And at least if we summarized the eight randomized control trials, you can see that in most of the trial, the risk of serious infection was decreased with tocilizumab compared with placebo or usual care. And it was even significant in the Boston trial, even though this trial was not positive regarding the outcome, which was ventilation or death. Just I show you uh, uh, some of the most uh, important studies with TOSI, which is the remap cap recently published in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this study included patients in ICU, but just after their entry in ICU, you can see that the median time was uh, 12 hours, uh, 13 hours, just after entering the ICU. Patients were on mechanical ventilation, non-mechanical ventilation on high flow, and very interestingly, there is a benefit of survival up to day 90, as you can see here. And this study included tocilizumab in light blue, but also sarilimab in dark blue. Very few patients on sarilimab, but there was also a positive result with sarilimab. And of course, we have the recovery study, not yet published, but available on MedArchive, with 4,000 patients on tosi or usual care. And you can see the repartition of the patients, oxygen only, high flow, or invasive medical ventilation. Most of the patients received uh, steroids, and that's very important and different from the first study we conducted in France. And you can see the results. There is a benefit of tocilizumab regarding the survival at 28 days, a 14% decrease of mortality in this patient. Interestingly, if you look at the subgroups, you can see that the benefit occurs in the patient on oxygen, but not in patients in ICU with invasive medical ventilation, conversely to Remapcap. And second interesting point, the benefit occurs in the patients when they recite at the same time dexamethasone and not in the patients without any dexamethasone. Uh, in this paper, which is not yet reviewed and not yet published, there is a meta-analysis of the eight trials, and you can see that the results is roughly the same as the results with recovery, with a 13 to 14% decrease of mortality with tocilizumab in the, the eight RCTs. Before finishing, just a word about the other immunomodulators. Firstly, IL-1 inhibitors could be something interesting in this disease. So in our group, the Corimuno-19 group, we conducted an RCT with anakinra at high dose, as you can see here, 400 milligrams for three days, which could be uh, done again uh, with three additional days in case of no improvement compared to uh, usual care. And I go very fast because the results are completely negative. That's the primary endpoint, uh, mechanical ventilation or death or non-invasive or mechanical ventilation or death, no difference. And you look, if you look at survival, even up to day 90, there is no difference between anakinra and usual care, conversely to what we have seen with tocilizumab. What about baricitinib, JAK inhibitors? There is this RCT published in New England Journal of Medicine associated with remdesivir for hospitalized patients. And uh, it can be interesting because there is, uh, the primary endpoint is met, but only one day uh, less in the hospital with uh, the combination uh, of remdesivir plus baricidib. It's not very impressive, but look at the different subgroups. That's the overall results. But if you look at the patient without any oxygen, absolutely no benefit. Patient on oxygen, no benefit. But the benefit of baric plus remdesivir seems to occur in these patients with non-invasive ventilation with high flow and no benefit in patient on mechanical ventilation. So the, the message is, it's very important to have very homogenized group, subgroup of patients to test immunomodulators. And uh, lastly, colchicine, yeah, this, this study is not yet published, but it is on MedArchive, a big study again, 4,000 4, patients. So a very different group of patients, patients non-hospitalized at home at the beginning of the infection. You can see that the primary endpoint is not met but if you consider only the patients with a PCR positive, you can see there is a statistical difference regarding the primary endpoint, which was hospitalization or death. And you can see here that the, 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 the rate of death was numerically decreased in the patient on Colchicine. So to conclude, 
immunomodulators should not be given early in COVID-19 infection. Today, the only immunomodulator having clearly demonstrated a beneficial effect on survival is corticosteroid, and only in patients requiring oxygen and in ICU patients. There is probably a room for TOSI associated or not with DEXI, probably associated with DEXA. We'll see in our new study in patients on at least three liters a minute of oxygen and with no improvement on DEXA. Probably no room for anakinra and maybe an interest of combination between immunomodulators and antiviral drugs. And you do know that we don't have a good antiviral drugs and maybe interferon could be something interesting to test associated with immunomodulators. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be very pleased to respond to the questions. Well, thanks, uh, Xavier, for a kind of a whirlwind tour. Uh, you know, I'll start out, uh, you know, this is, uh, I say that uh, looking at the, uh, at the, at the IL-6 data in uh, COVID is like being in one of those MC Escher drawings. You know, you kind of walk up the stairs and you wind up in the same room that you started out with. Um, I, I'm sure you're aware that at least based on press release, you know, the, the long awaited Remdacta trial, which, you know, had a high rate of background corticosteroids plus Remdesivir uh, with tocilizumab was absolutely negative trial and, and very disappointing to, to all. We wait the, the deeper dive. Do you think, um, I, I mean, obviously this has an effect in the right patient at the right time. I have this feeling that the, the entry criteria we are using, you know, by default are so crude. I, I mean, you know, like, are you in oxygen? Are you need more oxygen? Uh, what's your CRP? I mean, there, we, we now are getting this picture that there are numerous immunologic endotypes I, I mean, we need better biomarkers to select these drugs. Just thoughts? Yeah, of course, Selene. I, I, I do agree with that. It's the reason why I wanted to share with you this very new data about ICRP, low CRP, which is the beginning of a biomarker. And clearly, our impression in our first trial is that the patient who may benefit from the drug are the most uh, inflammatory patients. but. Of course, we would like to have more sophisticated biomarker for deciding what patient could benefit from TOSI. Uh, yeah, and as you said, what is crucial is the subgroup analysis because uh, I think uh, not uh, every patient may benefit from the drug, but I, I think the other important point is really to reassure, especially our colleagues in ICU, because they are very afraid of immunomodulators in these patients and our really you have seen all the eight RCT, we don't see any increased risk of serious infection, at least when it is given at the beginning of uh, ICU uh, entry, because of course, in the patient already ventilated for one week, we are going to see all the ICU complications that we know very well. Evan, let me ask you, um, so um, a very hot topic right now is baricitinib. And, uh, you know, we've seen that data. We know that there is a trial that we're, we're waiting for, for, for uh, release of data. And we know that the NIH uh, has the ACT-4 trial in place, uh, baricitinib versus dexamethasone versus combination. Um, where are you thinking uh, uh, baricitinib compared to tocilizumab right now? I think this design is a very good design, firstly. Uh, because the, 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 the study I, I have presented with combination to remdesivir is too complicated and we cannot really address the efficacy of Barry alone. So the new design uh, of the NIH study is good. Uh, so uh, Barry uh, has a very high anti-IL-6 activity, as you know, uh, but uh, in addition, it is inhibiting other cytokines. So uh, I think it is an interesting drug uh, and so I, I, I'm waiting for, for the results. And uh, if, we, if we think about the other target that we do know very well in rheumatology, there is also GMCSF. Uh, GMCSF, which is an important cytokine, uh, myeloid cells are very activated in COVID-19 and very immature my myeloid cells, which may play a role. 
And so the studies with anti-GM CSF are uh, probably also very important. And the interest of JAK inhibition is that you may combine inhibition of IL-6 and inhibition of GM CSF. But I'm afraid with Barry and JAK inhibitors about the inhibition of interferon. Personally, I think it's not a good thing. We have data in our patients showing that all these patients that have high interferon, but the patients having a drop of interferon between D1 and D6, the patients who are not able to maintain a high interferon level are the patients who may have a worse outcome and we may have a risk of dying. Kevin. Yeah, I'll just, uh, a couple thoughts. I mean, I, Xavier, that was a great uh, presentation. And, and, you know, Len Xavier and I wrote this editorial in ARD a couple months ago, I don't know, six months ago, it's been a whirlwind, just trying to summarize the IL-6 data at that time. Uh, I don't think anything's changed. It's still uh, completely confusing and I don't, uh, I don't understand it. I mean, and Xavier, you didn't mention the two negative cerulimab trials uh, also in that list. So, so you've got a mechanism of action of which there's basically 10 major trials, uh, only four of them are positive. And it, when you look at the four that are positive, different subgroups are driving the result. I mean, in one trial, it's people not on mechanical ventilation, and the other trial, it's those on mechanical ventilation. And I think one of the problems, too, Xavier alluded to, is that the, the use of background steroids has really changed over the time mm -hmm. course of those eight or 10 trials. And so it's, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I think if I if I thought anything, I thought, uh, I think there may be some activity in certain subgroups who are also using dexamethasone. But I, for right now, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly who in the hospital I'd want to put on an IL-6 inhibitor um, based on that data. In, in terms of the JAKs, I mean, you're right. So so the one, uh, like you and Xavier mentioned, the, the Berry study um, that's been published is is provocative. It had a positive result. It shortened time to clinical recovery, particularly in certain subgroups, like Xavier highlighted. Um, there was no increased risk of, um, you know, VTE or coagulation issues, which I think was reassuring. Um, obviously, in the U.S., people haven't necessarily uh, chosen to use it in combination with uh, dexamethasone. I think people, institutes, are choosing one or the other in these patients. They've been hesitant to use them both together. So the study you mentioned um, you know, we should have some data very soon that's going to comment on the safety of that approach. I, I personally think it's probably going to be safe. I mean, because if you look at the TOS plus um, or the IL-6 inhibitor plus steroid data, you don't see a uh, difference in safety in the people on steroids uh, and people not on steroids. I suspect we'll probably see something uh, similar in, in the baricitinib trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really agree with you, um, uh, Kevin, regarding uh, the, uh, the difference which could be induced by the fact of preserving or not dexamethasone with every immunomodulators. It's the reason why now I think all the new trials should compare to the standard of care, which is dexamethasone. Yeah. And after, it depends of, of what you expect from the drug. Uh, could it work alone? And you, in this case, you compare dexamethasone to your drug. Or could it work with in association with DEXA and you compare DEXA plus uh, DEXA versus DEXA plus your drug? And it is what we are doing with, now with Tocidex, with Tocidezumab in a very uh, clear, uh, homogenized uh, subgroup. And I hope that it will help to, yeah. to answer to your question what patients Yeah, need. no, I agree. And I think that's the right approach. So hopefully some of these newer studies like yours will, will help us you know, hone in on the right subgroups in which to use that drug mm -hmm. or that approach. I want to get back and, and uh, ask uh, Xavier a little bit more about the interferon response because this is very complicated. Uh, you know, I, I think it's quite clear that uh, interferon is playing a big role up front. And in fact, people that recover from mild or posse symptomatic uh, COVID, you know, you don't see much of an antibody response and you see palpably lower uh, cell mediated response. It has to be driven by interferon. The late interferon phenomena, as you refer to, is that you know when when interferon starts to fall. I'm not convinced that that is. Uh, I, I think that that's symptomatic of this uh, dysregulated immune response. I mean, I don't, I don't think that. 
I don't, I, I'm not even convinced you need interferon then. At that point in time, it's, they're, they're, it's looking from a number of lines of, of data that this, this may be driven by damps as opposed to just viral load. And so, you know, I think uh, it, 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 it creates a very important question. If that's true, then, you know, more intense and select immunomodulatory therapies needed. If it's not true and you're in an interferon deficiency state for host defense, then, you know, this, you know, bear sitting of Jack stuff is important. Well, how do you, how do you sort that out? Yeah, that, that's a very, a very good point. I do agree. The reason why we have not yet begun a, a trial with, with interferon for all, all these, uh, these reasons, as you said, but Len, you are aware also of the study from the, the Casanova group showing that uh, the 10% of the patient with anti-interferon antibodies have a worse outcome. And the same for polymorphism in the uh, interferon pathway genes uh, associated with a lower uh, interferon activity also associated with worse outcome. So my impression is that we need interferon for fighting against the, the, the virus, but I, you are completely uh, right. Uh, is it necessary to give more? I don't know. It's very interesting. You know, the, we've uh, uh, have, have, have written a bit about this interferon uh, antibody situation. I just saw a French group. Uh, uh, I don't know, it could be you. I don't know. It I know it's affirmed this. Well. Yeah, it was almost twenty percent. It was uh, impressive. Mm. Yet at the same time, Mariella Kaplan has looked at patients with lupus who have neutralizing type one antifurin antibodies who seem to do just fine getting COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there's something, yeah. something there that we don't quite grasp uh, because you know, a third of lupus patients, well, at least a third, maybe, maybe a half will have neutralizing antibodies. So I think that's a, a, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Very, very. Well, I, I mean, one other question is, do, do the people develop neutralizing antibodies uh, because of COVID? I, it's not clear to me that those are all people with pre-existing. Well, a couple of them had pre-existing where there are serum samples in the Casanova study. So that's, that's all we know. But this yeah. whole area, and, and I know we're getting pushed into the next section, but uh, we have to do uh, a round table on autoimmunity and COVID next time because yeah, uh, you absolutely. know this whole notion of COVID turning on the auto antigenome uh, and all these autoantibodies and what they mean right now is a is a vital question and a work in progress and we re don't really don't really know but it's very exciting cutting edge stuff. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop because I'm getting prodded here. So Kevin. You got uh, just to talk to, about what? just like to respond to Edgar uh, in the quick Q and R. No, today we don't have uh, we don't have better uh, biomarker than CRP. We don't have a composite of CRP plus another biomarker for predicting the response. But we have in our study uh, study we uh, looked at numbers of biomarkers, and I hope that uh, maybe we could uh, respond more precisely to this question. Thank you. I, 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 that would be great. I, I know. I know a lot of these studies now are doing secondary analysis, trying to find uh, uh, predictive biomarkers. All right, Kevin, your kick. Yeah. So, um, well, good. I have a quick ten minutes to uh, take you through another confusing, exciting area: <laughs> vaccines. I'm just going to hit the highlights lens so that we have time to talk about it. Uh, the different vaccine constructs, uh, the different approaches that have been used, RNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, uh, vector vaccines, et cetera, uh, most all of them are relying on producing immunity to uh, uh, the spike protein and different aspects of the spike protein that's shown here in the graphic. It's the graphic we've all seen you know, a million times the last 12 months. Uh, and that spike protein, of course, uh, contains the receptor binding domain um, the idea, of course, is if you generate antibodies to that domain, you will neutralize the virus, hopefully, and prevent it from entering cells. So um, that's, that, that's just a quick overview. Um, this process, I'll just say, has been unbelievably efficient. Uh, we've had the time uh, uh, for vaccine development, um, yet still enrolled the same numbers of people in 
trials that we would normally for other vaccines in their development. So it's really been a, an incredible, I think, um, accomplishment by, um, by everyone who's been working on it. Uh, just a few things to highlight in terms of the immunogenicity of the vaccines. This is the mRNA vaccine from Pfizer. Uh, and this is just the classic uh, description from early studies. And you see this with most, uh, all the vaccines, at least all the vaccines that are out and being used now, that there's immunogenicity data uh, showing that, you know, after the primary shot, and if you just look on this graphic, the 30 microgram dose to the right is the one that is being used. Um, the shot was first given on day one where the arrow is, you can see on day 21, there's a little bit of uh, neutralizing antibody titer, not much, but of course, one week after the booster at day 21, you see a uh, a huge rise in titer, and that continues a bit more at day 35. So that the point here is that you do see uh, quite a large boost after the booster, uh, and that the titers and neutralized antibodies are uh, similar or greater to that. What is seen on the far right of the screen here is, uh, is neutralizing antibody titer in, in healthy convalescent uh, serum. So these are people who's, who've recovered from COVID. In all the vaccine studies, who have published their immunogenicity results have shown this, that their vaccine induces similar or greater, more robust responses um, than uh, is seen in healthy um, post-COVID survivor um, samples. Uh, for, for cell mediated responses, um, which we think are also important, uh, we see something similar. If you just look at the CD4 uh, T cell response here on the left, uh, you can see in the 30 microgram group, again, at quite a rise post-vaccination in, um, in reactive CD4 T cells uh, to um, the spike protein. And you see a similar rise in CD8 uh, T cells. And again, they, they try to make the point here that compared to the healthy control group who've recovered uh, from um, COVID, that, that the levels of cell-mediated immunity are similar or greater uh, than those individuals. So the hope is, of course, that the immune response is, is more robust, the vaccines will be more protective than natural immunity, and that that protection will last longer. So those are the hopes. That's what one might um, theorize based on the, the immunogenicity data. And of course, that's data that will be put to the test uh, in the real world. In terms of phase three data, um, we have good phase three data from large studies. And you know the efficacy is in the 90% range for both the Pfizer and the Moderna mRNA vaccines. The AZ story, which I hope to uh, quiz Xavier on a bit more after this talk in terms of the, the potential safety effects or side effects of the AZ adenoviral vaccine. Um, but the efficacy there is also quite high, but it's it's dose dependent seemingly in the UK where, where many pa patients were half dosed initially uh, on, the, on the primary shot, and then we're given a full dose on the booster. Uh, they seem to have greater efficacy than, than in other places where a full dose was used for both the initial and the, the boost. Um, you can see the efficacy is a bit lower in Brazil, and the most recent data from the U.S. shows about 76% efficacy here. It was 79%. The DSMB apparently was upset with that. AZ rejiggered re their numbers and then, then came back out a few days later with 76%. Apparently everyone's happy with that number. Um, you know, one of the problems with two is the later programs are also subject to more of the variants being involved in their studies. So it makes sense that the efficacy might kind of drift down with time, particularly depending on where uh, the studies are done in the world. In terms of reactogenicity, uh, this data is emblematic of, of also the, the other mRNA vaccine. Uh, and this is data meant to kind of mimic your patient population or older individuals generally. Uh, this was over age 55. You can see there's quite a bit of reacto. Uh, most of these are mild reactions, fatigue, headache, chills, um, muscle pain, joint pain. Uh, and I'll say that, you know, the, the reacto is more common after dose two, which is what this graphic uh, shows. Uh, it's also much more common in younger people, which I'm not showing you that slide, but the proportions of patients that have um, reactogenic events are, are much higher in younger individuals uh, who are more uh, immunocompetent. In terms of the adenoviral vaccines, here's the AZ vaccine. This is a chimp adenoviral construct, uh, very similar to the data I showed you before, day, day zero and then day 28 and day 35. You see, you know, after the primary uh, you see this rise in uh, neutralizing antibody titers. 
Uh, and, you know, again, the, the level that at which these people end up is very similar or greater to what you see with convalescent uh, samples from, from patients who've recovered from COVID. And here's the cell mediated data. Again, very similar here. You can just look at the middle box. This was a prime strategy and a prime boost strategy. Um, either way, you see uh, levels of cell mediated immunity. These are LA spots looking at reactive um, CD4 cells. And you can see that uh, the reactivity has increased between zero and, and day 28. Um, what are MOS cells good for? I just love the Novavax story. I love that they use this baclovirus uh, to deliver spike protein DNA uh, and into a fall armyworm MOS cell. I, I've seen fall armyworms in my house before. I think they eat my sweaters, but, but I guess <laughs> I should collect them uh, because they are uh, remarkably adept at cranking out uh, spike protein uh, using this uh, approach. So you crank out a bunch of spike protein, you, you put all these little uh, spike proteins in a synthetic particle and you marry it with saponin, which is essentially very similar uh, to the adjuvant used in uh, the herpes zoster subunit vaccine, Shingrix, uh, and it comes from uh, the soapbox tree. Uh, it's highly uh, immunogenic. And then of course you inject these things together. Uh, and what you see here is again, very, uh, very good immunogenicity. Uh, this is the, um, the IC50s of the neutralization titers. Uh, you can, again, just look at uh, what I'm circling here, the kind of the third group over, but b b uh, compared to day zero, day 21, day 35, again, the prime and boost strategy, you see this gradual increase in neutralizing titers that are, again, uh, similar, or, or in this case, again, higher to what is seen in the human conval convalescent serum. Uh, phase three results here. I, the nice thing about these two programs is they have South Africa components where the South African variant is, uh, is really a big proportion of the cases. Uh, we did see reduced efficacy with that variant in South Africa. Um, overall, Novavax was about 90% effective in the UK, but again, 60% uh, in South Africa. The J&J &J, uh, adenoviral vaccine, which really is nice because it's one shot, you don't have to deep freeze it. Um, and of course, they have a two-shot vaccine study in the U.S. that hasn't reported yet. But the one-shot vaccine studies showed uh, decent, you know, good efficacy, 72% in the U.S. And again, reduced with the South African strain. In terms of durability of response, Moderna's data, uh, you can just read what I circled at the bottom. Uh, but uh, patients uh, seem to, uh, at least four to five months later, have still high levels of neutralizing antibodies as well as memory uh, T cells and B cells. And they looked at a number of markers of uh, durability and uh, at least up to four to six months, it looks pretty good. The variant strains I've mentioned, these are just some of them, there's lots of them. Uh, the South African one is, has been the one of, of most worry because it is, uh, it is less susceptible to the immunity that's produced by uh, the vaccine as well as the monoclonal antibody products. Um, and in fact, here's some data that uh, Pfizer produced, and this was uh, neutralizing activity um, from individuals who'd been vaccinated with their vaccine and against the variants. Uh, it all looks pretty good, although you do see some uh, decrease here uh, compared to some of the other strains, and this decreases the, the South African strain. So, so here there does appear to be some reduction. It's, it's mild, and it, it is not thought to affect the efficacy of the vaccine, although I would say we totally uh, don't know that yet. Um, that is my last, oh, here's my last slide. The ACR put out recommendations. We can talk about these. Um, and the idea is maybe we should be holding some of our DMARDs while we're vaccinating. Some of these DMARDs may affect the vaccine response. All of this data is data that's taken from or extrapolated from other vaccines uh, that have been tested in the face of DMARD use. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll end because we don't really know the answers here yet. Uh, we're starting studies and others are starting studies to, to answer this question. So thanks, guys. That's it. Okay. Uh, please type in uh, your questions and the answers and uh, we'll, 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 we'll get to them. So, um, so, so many ways to go here. Um, First, a comment, uh, there have been a, a, a spate of uh, papers um, in image patients 
um, looking at a vaccine response, mostly by tracking uh, neutralizing antibody uh, of patients on um, uh, biologic therapies, a uh, couple short uh, papers in ARD. I mean, I think the early, the early news is, is that most people, the vast majority of people are responding and uh, with, with that, and we don't know anything. It's usually after one vaccine and we don't know what their cell mediated immune response is. And we don't know, we don't really have a good crisp uh, uh, protective correlate of these antibodies, but uh, it, my take is it's sounding pretty good for our patients. Although we don't have a very broad or large database of all the different drugs and combinations. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I would just say I totally agree with that, Lynn. There, there was an interesting study published uh, just a few days ago from the GI literature. And it's not a post-vaccine study, but it was a post-COVID. Post yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, the, and the folks that were on infliximab as compared to vedolizumab, you know, had a lot lower antibody titers post-infection. Um, and, you know, I, I, I looked at that, I thought, well, maybe it's because they had less symptomatic disease. You know, maybe the infliximab yeah. was somehow protective. Uh, but, but actually, the, the two groups had very similar spectrums of clinical presentations and disease severity. So that didn't explain it. So I find that an intriguing observation. Um, I, I do think TNF blockers probably are protective against developing more severe disease. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what that means for the vaccine, you know, people on those drugs. Maybe we'll see lower titers. I mean, we certainly do see that in other vaccines in people who are on TNF blockers. So, so I guess we'll just have to see. It's yeah. ironic. I have this paper on my desk just uh -huh. now. This was, this was not a plant. This That's the paper. Plant. But, but the, but the, the interesting part in here was that the, um, the uh, infliximab patients, the, the vast majority of them were also on anti-metabolites, you know, to yeah. ward off that and the uh, betalizumab weren't. So this yeah. could be like the methotrexate dealio yeah. thing. So, I mean, I, and, and, and what does this all mean in terms of outcomes? We don't know, but I mean, there's, there's going to be an effect uh, uh, there. Um, Xavier, your, your thoughts. I had, I had a, I had a, a an email from a, a, a guy uh, doing a, a very quick study on his abatacept patients, uh, looking at neutralizing antibodies, and he was like 0 for four uh, in the uh, in this. And I said, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we have to have more data about our patients with RMD vaccinated against COVID. And just, I, I want to, to, to announce you that with EULA, we have set up a registry, which is called uh, EULA COVAX. Just a very simple registry. You just have to, to enter your patients uh, with an RMD when he is or she is vaccinated. And just to look at, was there any flare of the disease, any special side effect? And so we have already 1,000 patients, including the registry, and it could be something which could be shared with Global Alliance uh, to have the, as many patients with autoimmune disease as possible in this registry. Uh, any quick takes on post-vaccine adverse events? And you can wind up talking about uh, AZ on this, but what about rheumatic uh, uh, experience thus far? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, I, yeah, I, I want to steer the coagulopathy question as Avier, just simply because we haven't seen it in the U.S. We don't have a lot of data. But, but I mean, in terms of AE profile of vaccines outside of that question, these vaccines have been remarkably safe. Um, they're, you know, aside from a few Bell palsies, uh, there is kind of some interesting case reports of people developing herpes zoster shingles outbreaks right after the time of uh, vaccination. Um, and I also had a huge gout flare the day after my vaccination. So, you know, there, there's these reports out there. Um, but, um, you know, overall, these vaccines have been remarkably safe in terms of serious infections. And there, there hasn't really been any reports of new autoimmunity yet. Um, I think the not question of flare, 
Yeah, yeah, not many, oh. uh, except for my gout. I already told you about my gout. <laughs> um, Is that a HIPAA violation? <laughs> no, no, I signed something. I signed away. Okay. But, yeah. but you know, I, I think um, – I think the issue of flaring underlying autoimmune disease, of course, is is an issue. I've, of course, heard reports of that. I've seen reports of that. I'm sure you guys probably have, too. I don't know the magnitude of that problem. So I, I would defer to you guys to, to tell me what you've seen in your clinics. But um, obviously, it's something that we, we want to study more systematically. Mm -hmm. So that, that registry that Xavier mentioned will be helpful. And of course, we're doing similar things over here. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, today, uh, 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 ARD uh, um, just published a, a small or, or Lancet. I can't remember it's so many things here, but from the from the Brigham MGH group that looked at uh, a very nice study that looked at um, all their uh, patients uh, who had um, um, asking the question about post-COVID autoimmunity. Uh, um, and they really showed a, a little bit of a differential effect that people are, you know, this, this virus and probably the immune response to this virus may be able to unmask certain, you know, auto yeah. immune, or, uh, immunologic dysregulatory uh, states. And the, and the other thing I'll just throw out, you know, I, I, I don't think that we have a full grasp of, you know, what, mRNA vaccines have the capacity to do. And, and I agree with you. I, 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 absolutely, the, the big picture is very, very safe. But as we go to talk about AZ, you know, this mRNA is disseminated systemically. It is not just in local regional lymph nodes. Uh, this can cross the blood-brain barrier. This can be taken up by, you know, myocytes and uh, neuronal tissue and any tissue, it just, it, it, it fuses with membranes. And yeah. so, you know, putting, that doesn't happen with IM protein vaccines. Uh, so I think that we need to be prepared for future surprises. So Xavier, tell, tell us about uh, AZ and strokes and thrombopenia. Yeah, firstly, I want to say that the AZ vaccine is a very efficient vaccine in real life. We have studied in Scotland where one and a half million of people, people have been vaccinated with AZ and the decreased risk of hospitalization for COVID is 94% with only one dose. So firstly, it's very efficient and it is thanks to AZ that UK now is going much better than the other countries in EU and we have to remind that. Secondly, now I think we are almost sure that there is a link between the AZ vaccine and some very rare thrombotic events, which are stroke, uh, cerebral thrombophlebitis, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. I think now an EMA today says that there is a very probable link between this complication and AZ. Today, I think we have around 60 cases, 60 in Europe, in UK, Germany, and France. So the risk is between one over 100,000 and one over 500,000. So there is a very, very low risk uh, of this complication, especially in young people. It's the reason why, for example, in France, AZ now is not recommended uh, below 55 years. So there is this uh, very rare risk, but again, it is a very uh, efficient vaccine. And so now we have to find what are the factors which predispose to the risk. And because this complication is probably a, a very, uh, very uh, important on the telium and jury linked to the immune reaction to the vaccine and maybe to the adenovirus. So uh, for, and just excuse me to be a little long, but maybe in our patients, I think we have to be very cautious in patients with endothelium injury, I mean antiphospholipid syndrome, vasculitis, and uh, uh, in these patients, maybe we should choose another vaccine than AZ. Yes. There's a, a, a German group that has identified uh, antibodies to this platelet factor four that is like what the heparin antibodies are in a few of these patients and have suggested that maybe people that have pre-existing antibodies, this may, which must be very rare, but uh, that might be a risk. And then the antiphospholipid question, of course. So I'm gonna to get to some questions here from the, from the uh, people tuning in here. Um, 
Uh, what about uh, uh, patients who are already on a JAK inhibitor and they want to get vaccinated? Um, do, you know, where where do we fall on that? Uh, do you stop it? Start it? There's not much guidance there. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, uh, it's obviously unknown. I can tell you what I'd personally do. Uh, and I mean, that's based on, again, other types of vaccines and our, our experience with uh, patients who are on JAK inhibitors. Also based on some of the data presented uh, around Shingrix, uh, although it was preliminary, um, you know, that was at ACR last year. I, you know, I, I think in general, I think, Look, I think jack and hairs are going to probably affect the immune response to the vaccine. Whether they affect it enough to be clinically relevant, of course, is, is another question. But if I was on a jack inhibitor and I had um, you know, stable disease, I, I would stop it. You know, the ACR recommended a week. Again, it's based on extrapolation from those other uh, vaccine studies, flu studies, pneumococcal studies, et cetera. Um, I don't know. I kind of think if I'm going to stop for a week, I stop it for two weeks. That's what I do. Because <laughs> if you do, if you get a week, you might as well do the whole deal. Go two weeks because the, the two week immune building experience post vaccination really is important. I, I don't know which is more important the first week or the second week, but I do know. Um, What's your rapid views? I'm, I'm putting. start, stop the drug, uh, continue it. Um, your audio blocked out there, Len. Can you, could you repeat that? I'm afraid we cannot hear you, Len. Kevin, I think um, and Xavier, I think Len's having internet problems. Uh, can you guys carry on the discussion? Sure. Uh, can um, you guys hear me now? Oh, there, that's better. You're back, Len. All right. So you, a person with stable RA on a JAK inhibitor gets COVID. Uh, COVID's uh, mild in the first few days. Should I stop my JAK inhibitor? Or should I continue it? <laughs> Maybe uh, I, I, I can try to also to respond. Uh, Kevin is right regarding experience with other vaccines, flu or, pneumo or pneumococcus. Regarding uh, COVID, we don't have any data, as COVID said. And for me, my priority is to convince the patients to be vaccinated. And you do know that our patients with autoimmune diseases, sometimes they are reluctant to do that. So I try to be as simple as positive. So before I have data about decreased vaccination effect with JAK or beta 8 I say that I, I, I tell the patients, just continue your treatment as it is. Because I want to have the really to convince, because if, if it is too much complicated, I'm afraid the patients will refuse to be vaccinated. So it's the reason why Eula today just didn't say anything about stopping drugs and just uh, uh, maybe we are waiting for having new data about that. Or what, what about the case I just told you that they're on a JAK inhibitor and now they have COVID infection and they're doing okay in the first two days and they call you. Should I stop my JAK inhibitor? Should I continue it? I was asked a patient this morning. I had a patient exactly in this situation. And, and? What, what I told this patient is that you do like every severe infection on biologics. I mean, if you don't have fever, you continue baricitinib, the patient wasn't baricitinib. If you have fever and if you are bad, you stop baricitinib exactly when, when like you have flu or a, a, a serious infection. I don't know, Kevin, if you agree with that. And then, and then you restart it when you're on oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yes. <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, I, I've had four patients so far and I've told them all to stop their jack inhibitor. And yeah. I, They've all done great, so I'm four for four. But you know, almost everyone is going to do great anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I I don't know. I don't. Obviously, we don't know the answer, but um, but I agree with how Xavier just outlined the approach, and that would be consistent with what we've recommended so far at ACR. But um, I guess it could change, of course, with with data. Yeah. So. Um, uh, any role for uh, ask.
So um, I think Len's uh, video froze up, and I think he's All asking right. a question from the, yeah, any, the chat. Any, any uh, uh, role for aspirin or anticoagulation around a vaccine? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know. But regarding question. the first question about uh, Jack inhibitors and uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, no, uh, as you have as you have heard, the risk of thrombosis is not the classical thrombosis. It's not uh, pulmonary embolism or a thrombophlebitis. It is really stroke, very rare thrombosis. So I think uh, it's not a contraindication to AstraZeneca vaccine if a patient in on baricitinib. But again, at least in my country, I would I will not use uh, AZ if he's less than 55. Yeah, I, I don't, my understanding is that none of those people had risk factors for that type of uh, coagulopathy or, or known risk factors. You know, some of the stuff Len was talking about might exist in terms of genetic predispositions, but um, but I, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think I'd use aspirin and I don't think I'd avoid jack inhibitors for all those reasons. I don't think they're related to, and, and you know, we should say the AZ, what, what is the risk, Xavier? It's one in 500,000 or what's the, the rate? I mean, it's pretty rare. Yeah, well, it is exactly what I said. It is around between one over uh, 100,000 and one over 500,000. So it's very, yeah. very rare. In the world of vaccine hesitancy, that's very large. Well, it, you know, it is, and I'll, I'll kind of play devil's advocate. I mean, if I'm a 20 year old guy, and my risk of death in the U.S. from COVID is about one in a hundred thousand, um, which is what it about it is. You know that that's kind of massa manos, right? I mean, there, <laughs> there's not a lot of difference between uh, yeah. one in a hundred thousand, one in five hundred thousand. I, I guess at least when you're twenty. So. Hmm. Yeah. No, I I, I agree. Uh, well, there's so much more to talk about, and we I I hope that we were able to uh, come back and talk about. Uh, COVID and autoimmunity and in uh, this very provocative area of uh, uh, long COVID and mechanisms and uh, uh, just to, to, we're going to be, no matter what this infection does, we're going to be uh, studying it and talking about it for a long time to come because uh, we're learning a lot of stuff. I think we're just about up against the hour here. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, uh, give my uh, summary here of, uh, you know, we, 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 we I, I don't know what the summary is. We, we've talked about all the data. Uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions. We definitely have made progress in the area of therapeutics, uh, now trying to fine tune the recommendations of drugs and the right patients and the right endotypes. We're being, we are blessed uh, with these vaccines yet they're posing uh, uh, complex issues for patients on IMIDs and their attendant therapies and trying to sort out uh, the, the, the rare toxicities that are uh, lying ahead. The future in uh, COVID and COVID vaccine um, it is getting uh, uh, demanding and this issue of uh, autoimmunity, long COVID uh, awaits uh, further uh, reflection. So I wanna thank both of you uh, for fabulous uh, presentations and uh, look forward to doing this again. Thanks guys, that was fun. Bye, thank oh, you. Uh, and and the, the boilerplate here is that, please, we want your feedback. Uh, I know it's hard getting in all these questions, um, but uh, I think that the, the discussion was uh, very stimulating. Give us your uh, evaluation form um, and this will be up on YouTube and uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter for sure. It, it's the only way to 